know about you is that you have ambition to be great. My job is to coach you to get all that greatness out of you. What is good, Fin Nation? What's good? It's your boy, Reason. And we are back here for another one. As Mike McDaniel begins to assemble his staff, some remain, some might be going, and some are new faces. We got three individuals we want to talk about today. I'm going to talk about that. Roger Goodell also made comments today regarding the bribe allegations. We're going to get into that. And did Gerald Alexander's wife on Twitter blow the lid off of who was actually calling defensive plays for the Miami Dolphins. We're going to talk about that as well, because it seems like she did. And much to everyone's surprise, I'm sure, Brian Flores, again, was untruthful with us, it seems. At least that's what she's implying. So we're going to talk about that. Um, it is a great day to be a Dolphins fan as our staff continues to come, to come together. I'm telling you, the moment... Vic Fangio was hired. I am going to be doing handstands, cartwheels, my best dance impression over here. I'm going to be out here doing flash dance, pulling a chain and letting water fall down on me. I, I'm a hum I need that Fangio signing, baby. Let's get that come down the pipeline. Shout out to Richard. He says, new Pro Bowl member. Love your show, Reason. I appreciate you, Richard. Thank you for the donation. And thank you for becoming a member. Um, you know, you're going to get first access to videos. I'm actually thinking that, I'm going to, you know, you're going to get first access to the big boards before I release them. You're going to get first access to film studies before I release them. Um, so appreciate that, man. Thank you very much for becoming a channel member. You also get access to emojis only mid channel members have. So I appreciate that, man. So guys, um, there's already 130 of you in the room. Smash that like button. Subscribe. If you are new on our way to 7k, you know, the drill, all the ways to donate are in the description and rolling across the bottom of the screen right now but uh we got some stuff we want to get into um fanatical i actually agree with you if we would have brought rizzy back i would have been 110 percent down for that i agree good call fanatical uh twerk if we get vic yeah oh there you go i'll be twerking up on these youtube switch streets if we get vic fangio that's for sure man um <laughs> the greater good you know all all i can think about when you say that is Vince McMahon when Vince was like Brett screwed Brett. You know what I mean? When he's talking about when he made the jump to WCW. Now all I can think about is Brian screwed Brian. That's all I can think about right now when you said that, man. I um, appreciate you, Michael. Thank you very much for the kind words, my guy. Uh, Irving says he likes the early shows. Well, you got the early show because I got to record the finish line in about an hour and 45 minutes with Richmond Webb and Mr. Ballgame. So it was now or never for tonight. And guys, there's already 150 of you in the room. Again, smash that like button. I'm letting y'all know I'm going to be live tomorrow morning. I will be live at 10 a.m. And I will be live reacting to the Mike McDaniel press conference tomorrow. I will be live. We will be live reacting to the Mike McDaniel press conference. Man, there ain't no else place you want to be if you're going to be on YouTube watching Mike McDaniel get introduced than the guy who started the Mike McDaniel train. And that's your boy. That's your boy right here. So join me tomorrow morning. I'll be live at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Guys, I'll be live. We'll do a little, we'll do a little cup of Java with reason at 10 a.m. Man. All right. So come check me out 10 a.m. Tomorrow. We'll break it down. Um, three in the afternoon. There you go. Uh, Martina, you perfect time for you. You can have your, Afternoon tea and crumpets, and you can watch Reason. <laughs> Greater good says in the Latin community, Flores is <laughs> this guy. Oh man, uh, Scotty says you should be there. I should be there, should be there, but alas, I I have children to look after, my friends. It works out perfectly for me, to be honest with you, because my uh 14 month old it will go down at about 9 30, and then my other daughter, my three and a half year old, uh, about to be four in May. I can just give her her iPad and plop her on the couch over there and say, let daddy work. And she will let me go to work. So she's really good like that. So I'll be live at 10 a.m. tomorrow um, for the press conference. We'll be live reacting 10 a.m. Eastern. Yes, sir. Roy, that is when I might. I'll probably be on a little bit before that. 
like a couple minutes before that, just so we're early. So yeah, 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, you can expect me tomorrow morning. A lot of questions about tight ends right now. We'll get into all that. I do not think we draft a tight end. Um, you, you okay? So I have a show that's going to be coming up. I've been planning on doing it. It's going to be five players that I believe this regime should let walk, and five players they should keep. Durham Smythe is someone I think this this regime should keep. One hundred and ten percent. I think he's going to be perfect in this offense. Um, I would. You guys are going to call me crazy. But and this is just because of dollar value. All right. If we could get the guy for eight or nine million, I'd be all in. But because Mike Gesecki is going to be over 13 million a year, I would let him walk and re-sign Smythe and give Hunter Long a bigger role in year two. I think Hunter Long is perfect for what we want to do in our offense. So um, you know, but then part of me still says, is Mike McDaniel going to be infatuated with the weapon that Gesecki could be? So I'm like really torn on what to do with Gusecki. Like one half is like, he doesn't make sense. He doesn't block. He doesn't show a willingness to block. He's not good at it. You know, he gives away. He's a telltale sign of what the offense is about to do. You know what I mean? He gives away what we want to do to defenses. It doesn't work. But then another part of me is like, but the weapon and he has rapport with Tua and he's one of Tua's biggest supporters. And, you know, Tua likes targeting him. You know what I mean? And then you think about what Mike McDaniel and John Embry could do with Mike Gusecki as, as a receiver. And, you and you and you know, especially in this outside zone scheme we're about to go into. And, you know, it makes you salivate. But at the same time, you're like, yeah, but he's not going to get those opportunities in this outside zone scheme if he doesn't block. So it's like such a catch-22, and it's such a weird place to be in. It's going to be very interesting to see how that holds, how this whole goes down. Shout out. Thank you, Eric. Shout out from go BYU Cougs. I'm going to tell you right now, Eric, I love Tyler Alligier coming out this year, the running back out of BYU. I think he's fire. I think he's so good. Um, So it's going to be really interesting. Oh, uh, SJ, thank you very much. You actually just reminded me of something. I appreciate you for bringing up Mike Shanahan's name. Thank you very much. But yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how, how the tight end room plays out. I don't think you got Shaheen there. You can bring Smite back and you got Hunter Long and we still have Seathan Carter under contract for one more year. Do you really need to make a big splash? I don't think you need to. You know what I mean? Um... I don't think you got to – now, there's some good tight ends in this class, in this draft class, but I don't think it's a necessity. I don't think spending on that is wise. Spending capital on that is wise right now, especially with the amount of bodies we already could potentially have in the room because let's be honest. I mean, Durham Smythe ain't exactly going to break the bank, is he? You know, I don't think so. I don't think he will. At least I hope he wouldn't. So – you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how it all plays out. But, uh, I, you know, we're going to get into John Embry hire. I, I like the way this this staff is shaping up right now. Um, and I think if they add Fangio, you know, it's funny. I see it on all these different platforms. Why is it that all the people that don't want McDaniel to succeed are the same people that don't want Tua to succeed? Like, why is it like Tua's biggest haters – Seem to be McDaniel's biggest doubters. Am I? Am I? Am I off my rocker for making that correlation? Because I'm noticing it on like Twitter. I'm noticing it on YouTube. Like, you know, it just. I don't get it. You know, are our agendas so much at play? Are people so afraid of their narrative being wrong? I, I don't get it, because. You guys, you know, you some people are lining up to already do victory laps on McDaniel before he's even coached the game. These people are more worried about being right than their favorite team potentially wasting a number five overall pick if Tua doesn't work out. Um, you know, I, I just do not get it. We are not we are in a flux right now. We are we are in a stage where because of the age of our of a lot of key pieces on our defense. We can't afford to restart the maturation process of drafting a young QB. 
And then on top of that, there's no other QBs out there that we're going to be targeting. You know, two is the guy. Like, are we going to have to listen to Mike McDaniel and Tua Winers for the next 12 months at least? Like, I don't get how people wake up and 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 actively root for people that don their quote-unquote favorite team's colors and they actively root for those people to fail. Guys, everyone knows I don't like Jerome Baker. Everyone knows I think Jerome Baker is the most one of the most overrated players on this team when you actually look at the film. Do I root against jo- Jerome Baker? Everyone knows I've hated Austin Jackson since we drafted him. I didn't like him as a prospect coming out of UFC. I hated him as a prospect coming out of UFC. I hated the player. I didn't hate him. I hated the player. I didn't hate the person. I hated the player. Okay? Do I root against Austin Jackson? No. Because if I'm rooting against these guys to fail, my team's going to fail. I just, I, I, I sit back and I'm like, make it make sense. And then some people try to label it as, oh, I'm just being honest, so I'm telling the truth. But then when you actually dive into their explanations for why this isn't good, why this isn't good, it's like, no, you just have an agenda at play. You know, you can't sit down and in 20 minutes give me a thorough analysis because you're already, people already out here calling him a bust, people out here comparing him to Cleo Lemon, people out here doing that kind of stuff. Like, I already can't take you seriously because the tape dispels all of that. The tape shows you he's at least proven he's a competent NFL starter and he still has areas in his game that he needs to improve uh, improve on. You know what I mean? And then my biggest pet peeve, and this has been my pet peeve since I started this channel, what, in March, when did I start? March 2020, what was it, March 2020? So my issue... With this is, you know, context. All these people, you know, the offensive line sucks. But, you know, Tua still got to prevail over it because the offensive line sucking is an excuse. We run in a, a predominantly RPO heavy offense. We have the one of the worst rushing attacks in the NFL, whether you want to talk about just straight yardage or yards after contact. Well, that's 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 an excuse. He's got to overcome that. While Joe Mixon over here for Burrow, career year. Austin Eckler for Herbert, career year. Why? Because both teams in the last offseason upgraded their offensive line. Obviously, the Chargers better than the Bengals, but the Bengals were the 22nd ranked offensive line. We were the 32nd. So there's still a double-digit gap between our offensive line and their offensive line. Right? And when you look at a lot of Burrow's sacks, Burrow, people don't want to talk about it, but one of Burrow's weaknesses is he gets lazy with his hot reads and he takes hits because of it. Two out here. Dude, we got him over 243 pressures against, the most in the NFL by over 30, by at least by over 30 pressures. And yet Tua has one of the best pressures converted to sacks percentages out there because he evades and has elite pocket presence. You know what I'm saying? Like, I I just don't get it. Like, I don't get it. Those are contexts. Listen, why a player's successful and why a player's a failure or struggling, there's always context to each situation. It's not excuses. That's context. People need to look up the word in the dictionary and learn something. Why do you think John Elway didn't start winning Super Bowls until Shanahan came around? Let's talk about the context of the situation. He didn't have a Terrell Davis before that. He didn't have the Bill Romanowski defense he had before that. Now, are those excuses as to why he won? No, those are con- contextual reasons as to why he won. Peyton Manning had his neck fused, couldn't throw the ball, 
could not throw his career high 52 yards, whatever. When he was at last year's in Denver, that guy couldn't throw the ball beyond 40 yards, but he won. Why? Great offensive line, stacked receiving core, good running game, great defense. Are those excuses as to why Peyton Manning won? Those are contextual reasons as to why Peyton Manning got another Super Bowl. Like, here's the thing. You know why all you Tua haters and Tua doubters should be be excited? Because I've been telling you guys this since McDaniel was in the mix. No offense is going to fit Tua Tungvaloa at a pro-style level better than the Shanahan offense. It's what Sarkeesian ran in Alabama. He ran his version of the Shanahan offense. And now we got Mike McDaniel coming in. If anyone is going to maximize Tua's potential, it's going to be Mike McDaniel. We're going to find out if Tua's a good studier. We're going to find out if Tua has what it takes to be a top 12 quarterback in the NFL after a couple years under this guy. We are going to find a lot out. We're going to find out. It's year three. We're going to find out, is the durability thing a real issue? Year three, if we're going through it again, Three years in a row. You know, that's another reason why I've always said you got to give players three years, right? You start finding out who players are. You know, are we going to see the ball sailing over the middle? Are we going to see the mechanics get fixed up? Are we going to see him take another step returning towards that athlete he was in Tuscaloosa? Are we going to see him take another step towards gaining back the torque in his throws that he had in Tuscaloosa? We're going to find out a lot in year three. And this is why I've always been stressing year three. Since before we even drafted Tua, I didn't. Before, I said Herbert Burrow, Tua don't matter. Jordan Love don't matter. Three years. That's always the benchmark. Three years, you start finding out what people really are. And we're going to find out. You know, y'all should be excited because... We finally have an offensive mind we can trust to properly evaluate and to properly put Tua in a situation to be successful. Brian Flores did not hire an offensive mind good enough on that side of the football. For and None of us are going to trust Godsey. None of us are going to trust Studesville. Hell, not all of us know Charlie Fry was pretty much optics. There's no one on the offensive side of the football in that Flores regime we trusted to make a full evaluation of Tua Tungvaloa and to tell us whether he's the guy or not. We didn't trust Brian Flores. Quarterbacks isn't his specialty. Now, if he wants to tell me if a safety is going to be the guy or a corner is going to be the guy or a linebacker is going to be the guy or, you know, a, a, tackle's, a defensive tackle is going to be the guy or an end is going to be the guy, I'll listen. But it's what I said with Harbaugh, Caldwell, and McDaniel. And even I threw Dable in there. If these guys come in and they work with Tua for one year and they say he's not the guy, those are the minds you listen to and you say, okay, they're right. I, fa I fall in line with what they're saying. But if they come through and they say, I can make it work with this guy and they show us they can make it work, then you got to keep that same energy. You got to have that same trust. Again, objective, not being subjective. I was subjective in my want for McDaniel, but I was objective in the way I presented him to all of you. And I'm ob objective in the way he's going to handle this team. I follow my coach now. And you know what? I would have done the same thing with Brian Flores in year one. Well. Because he would have had Jim Caldwell with him. But then he ran him out of town. I'm not trusting Chad O'Shea or none of these jabronis over there. But I I'm telling you, that's where I stand right now. You know, and I don't get it. You want to be skeptical? Cool. But if you want to go on all these different platforms and take craps on, on, on this hire and everything going on, I don't get you, man. I don't get you. And I can't live in your miserable world. 
I, I can't. I can't. I know too much about Mike McDaniel. See, a lot of these people didn't know about who Mike McDaniel was until this this cycle around. They don't even remember him as an OC candidate last year because we never interviewed him. So, miss me with that. I'm not going to listen to people who don't know about the candidate through and through give me their opinion on him and then make lazy takes and comparisons, whether it's to Philbin, Cameron, Gase, whatever the case may be. Sorry, not. Like, there's too many people who don't know what they're talking about, whether it be the quarterback position, whether it be the new coach, whatever the case. They, they're writing their articles. They're making their video, whatever the case may be, making their videos, whatever. Making a little Facebook posts that don't know what they're talking about and are trying to pass off to people like they do know what they're talking about. Stop. When you're out of your depth, admit it. Stop instead of coming out here and exposing yourself to everyone and showing everyone you don't know what you're talking about. It's ridiculous. Like, Twitter's unbearable with it. Oh, my God. All right. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get into this. Um, so speaking of Mike McDaniel, let's start off with Mike McDaniel. Just to rub it in everyone who doesn't like Mike McDaniel. Let's see what Mike Shanahan had to say about my new head coach. Because this is what Mike Shanahan had to say. One of the best coaches ever had to say about my head coach. I've had the opportunity to watch Mike McDaniel grow as a coach over the last 17 years. Mike is very bright, driven, and detailed. He was with us at the Broncos in 20 in 2005 and was part of our 13 and three season. Then he continued to branch out and grow as a coach. Every opportunity he's received has opened for a reason throughout all of his stops, his offensive production and input with all of those teams was a big part of their success. Let's go, baby. I love my head coach and I will defend my head coach. And so people out here trying to crap on my head coach, especially if you don't know what you're talking about, you better avoid me because I ain't going to take McDaniel slander right now. Especially when this guy hasn't even coached the game. All right. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm going to come from, a, I'm going to come for people on this because it's ridiculous that people are taking a crap on this guy. When guess what? Like I said, all y'all that were hyped when we hired Flores. My boy Mike McDaniel's coming for a more proven tree in terms of coaches coming off of it and finding success. You go, you can't even find me one. One. Belichick disciple right now coaching in the NFL. Who has any kind of the success that McVay, LaFleur, and Kyle Shanahan have right now? Fact. So, as far as I can tell, Mike McDaniel might be more qualified at this stage of his career than Flores was, than Gase was, than Philbin was, than Camp Cameron was. All those guys had great quarterbacks. Go look at what Mike McDaniel made work. He didn't have a Brett Favre. He didn't have a Tom Brady. Just saying. All right. So shout out to my coach. Shout out to the endorsement from Mike Shanahan. I love it, man. I love it. That's my guy right there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, JP on sports. When the best of the Belichick coaching disciples was Bill O'Brien, how good is that tree, really? T-Mac, Vrabel technically isn't of Belichick's tree. Technically, he's not of Belichick's tree as a coach, right? So that's why Vrabel is not included in that conversation. Good, uh, A plus for an effort though. You are he played under him, so 
I get what you're saying. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, he uh, is not. Um, yeah, you can't really count him um, under that tree, right? So, yep, Vrabel is a, is a stud, but um, I'm pretty sure he. He the first guy to give him a job was uh, Lou Fickle at Ohio State, if I remember correctly, as a head coach. Well, as a head coach, as a positional coach, um, I think he was a linebackers or a defensive line coach or something like that. And then um, he went to Texans, right? Um, and I mean, I guess. Uh, Bill O'Brien, right, gave him his his chance. So he is he touches the Belichick tree in the same way Zach Taylor touches the Shanahan tree. So I'll give you that one. Oh, you know what? I'll give you that one. Um, because you know Bel Bill O'Brien came out from under Belichick, and then you know Bill O'Brien's part of the Belichick tree, and then Vrabel come under. But technically, the first guy to give him a shot was uh, Lou Fickle, and then he went under Bill O'Brien in the NFL. So shout out to Mike Shanahan for endorsing my coach. I love it, baby. Love every single freaking minute of it. Now, let's get into it. John Embry looks like he is about to be, and he is joining the Dolphins staff as their assistant head coach and tight ends coach. Um, obviously, as you guys know, he had the um, he had the same role with the 49ers for the past five seasons. I believe he came in 2017 when and in Kittle's rookie year, right? He came there. Um, so um 56 years old. Um, he's done fantastic stuff. Um, you know, assistant head coach experience. Um, and I mean, you look at what how he's helped develop George Kill into one of the best tight ends in the NFL. Um, and he was a tight ends coach with the Buccaneers, um, the Browns, the Redskins, and the Kansas City Chiefs before that. Um, and then he was a head coach um, at Colorado, his alma mater, from 2011 to 2012. And um, he had other assistant roles at Colorado and UCLA um, before that. You know, as much as, uh, you know, you got to remember, right? Not only has a great player um, like uh, George Kittle been under um, under him, right? But you got to remember, who else did he coach, right? If you go and you look, right, he was in Kansas City from 2006 to 2008. This man went out there and coached Tony Gonzalez. This man did not just coach. This man did not just coach George Kittle. This man coached Tony Gonzalez as well. This man has been around some of the best tight ends over the last 20 years. Um, and then when he was at Washington, I believe another uh was he was he was he let me let me make sure there. I'm pretty sure. Let me see here. Yeah. And um, so, <clears throat> I mean, you know, he's he, he he's coached Chris Cooley, you know, Jordan Cameron. Everyone remember Jordan Cameron with the Cleveland Browns, how good he was. Mercedes Lewis early on in his career. You know what I mean? And remember, you know, and he also coached uh, uh, Daniel Graham. And remember, Daniel Graham and Mercedes Lewis, they won the John Mackey Award for the top tight end um, in tw 2001 and 2005, right? So he's been around really good tight ends, you know, Kittle, Gonzalez, Cooley, Jordan Cameron, Daniel Graham, Mercedes Lewis. Those are no slouches. You know what I mean? So, and remember, Kittle in 2018, he recorded the then single season record um, of 1,377 yards under Embry in 2018 until Kelsey beat that in 2020. So um, I like the hire. I think this is a very good hire. I think this is an experienced guy and, and I really like it. Uh, you know, this is a guy whose success with tight ends 
do people actually remember how good Jordan Cameron was? I think people might be forgetting. Uh, maybe he can turn Hunter Long into the tight end we need, Florida Born says. I agree with you, Florida Born. I do think that is a great call. I think uh, I, I do agree with you 110% on that. Um, you know, you look at, man, think of it. His first NFL job, this guy was coaching Tony Gonzalez. Jesus. Man, the names that have gone through with this guy. Awesome, awesome stuff. He has been around some real, real good talent. And I'm really interested to see how he's going to infuse that into our tight end room. Really excited about John Embry, man. I think it's a great hire. It's one of the ones we originally were talking about, right? Um, and uh, when, when Mike McDaniel was hired, it was a name that I was originally floating out there and other people on other platforms were throwing it out there. Um, I like it, man. It's a good hire. It's a great hire. And uh, it's a good start to putting together, um, you know, this staff. All right, now let's get off. Uh, let's keep it rolling with John Embry. I wanted to show you guys this video um, of John Embry. That shout out to my homie Austin. He sent it towards me, to me, and uh, he said, "Yo, peep this out." And I watched it. I was like, "You know what? I want to show people this." And you know, it's um, John Embry talking about the power of relationships. All right, so let's bring this up. Bring this up. Full screen that hoe. Let's do this. All right. If it's a setback. Coach, um, who would you say? Because you've obviously went from high school to college, professional, now professional coach with the 49ers. Who would you say are maybe three key relationships that when you look back on all you've accomplished, you said these three relationships really, I know there's probably many, many more, but are, are there three that really stick out to you? where you said the relationship with that person always kept me in a good spot. I could call on them. I got great advice. Uh, you know, yeah. those three relationships. Yeah. yeah, the first one was uh, my high school position coach, uh, um, Jack Brookhart. Okay. He was the first person I'd been around. My dad was around off and on and all that. And, uh, but he was the first person to hold me accountable. Mm. and be honest with me and not let nothing slide just because uh, you were talented like he did not care so he was my football position coach and he was my head track coach oh. and so he had him twice a year huh? yeah buddy and he would just it was never you know you get the school record that that's easy that's who cares we haven't had anyone good here that you know <laughs> Da, 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 da. Like he was always on me. Mm -hmm. He was always on me, and I knew when I did good because he would just sit there smiling at me. He wouldn't say nothing. Say nothing. <laughs> he would just smile, chew his gum, and kind of shake his head a little bit. And, but that's and, all you needed. Yeah, and I knew, and I knew, you know. So he was the first one, and he was uh, one of the really the first people that I really felt like believed in me. Mm. You know, like you can tell if someone really believes in you mm -hmm. and uh he was the mr first flores Tatua. that i really felt like believed in me um the second would be my head coach in college bill mccartney mm -hmm. uh he did an unbelievable job recruiting me because i was i took my recruiting trip to decide between ohio state and ucla oh, okay. <laughs> and uh and colorado was it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was on my recruiting, and, and, and I ended up coming here and uh, just loved every minute of it. It was just just an unbelievable experience. But he was another guy that just really held my feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. And when I look back on it, you know, when you're 16 to 21, 22 age, it, it, what I was when I was going through those stages, that's, you know, really when you go from becoming a boy to a man. And I think those two guys, you know, not allowing me to take a shortcut, not, you know, uh, trying to sugarcoat stuff with me, just really being brutally honest. And then when it was time to be accountable and I didn't do what I was supposed to do, punishing me accordingly and, and afterwards let me know, hey, I still love you, but you just got it. You can't be doing that. You have to be better. And I think those two relationships had a huge impact on me 
uh, move forward as a coach and as a person. You know, the third, <laughs> the third, there's, there's, there's a few guys, uh, North Turner, Herm Edwards, mm. uh, Mike Shanahan. I, mm. think, I think those three really Look at the names shaped, shaped me as far as a coach, you know, um, North was my position coach when I played with the Rams. And then, you know, obviously he went on to great things, became a head coach, one of the top coordinators in NFL history. Um, you know, Mike Shanahan helped, you know, he's achieved a lot. And then Herm Edwards was another um, kind of like father figure. Like he, he, the way he spoke to you and the way that he. Uh, Teachers, man. Help, help you. And those three all, because of those three, I think, you know, Herm was the first guy to ever hire me as an NFL coach. I okay. didn't know him at the time, and, and he hired me, and then we ended up – we have a great relationship to this day. Okay. Um, you know, Mike Shanahan, Mike, I call him every offseason afterwards and pick his brain on just a million things. He, he just gives me a couple hours. I go he's okay house. with that? Yep, and I'm like, Coach, I just want to ask a bunch of questions, and I just want your your opinion on them, your answer, how you dealt with things, whatever it is. And so, you know, I did that with him. And then Norv, Norv's a guy that, um, when I first started coaching, brought me down to Dallas as kind of like an intern. Uh, and really, and this before I even had a coaching job. Mm. And I, he kind of saw that in me. And he kind of fostered that and help 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 feed that and and so uh it's why i am you know where i am today amazing do you feel i mean look at the minds this man has been under like we did not hire a jabroni here we went out and we hired a guy who preaches accountability but at the same time, you know, he's going to let players know how much he cares for them and how much he's there to support them. And you look at, he still leans on Mike Shanahan, you know, and, you know, I, I just personally think this is a great hire. I think this is another great hire, former player who's been around in terms of coaches and coordinators and players he's coached at the tight end position. A lot of greatness. The man's been around a lot of greatness. I think this is a fantastic hire. I really do. So, um, Jethro, you guys got Embry too. My God. Yeah, I, I, I think Embry is a great hire, man. Don't sleep on this. This staff is coming together very, very, very nicely right now. Shout out to 808 Niner Games. Says, congrats to McDaniel on a new journey with the Miami Dolphins. Hope nothing but the best for a great Miami Dolphins franchise. Go Niners. Appreciate it, man. That's the one thing. I got to give props to Niner fans. They've been like very, very, you know, they've been really awesome through this whole process. They've been so supportive of not only Mike McDaniel, but they've been showing the Miami Dolphins nothing but love for making this hire. So I got to, uh, I got to appreciate that, man. And with him being a tight ends coach and the assistant coach, bye-bye, George Godsey. This is the first man out the door. Godsey is somewhere flipping burgers or in the unemployment line. Uh, it's not It's not a goodbye, Mr. Godsey. We'll see you. We'll see you down the line somewhere. It's over. It's over. It's over. Um, Twin says already felt like Miami won the in the offseason game. Now it's time to transit in the season. We ain't done. We go get Fangio. We really starting to win out here in the offseason. Let's go We're before free agency. So it's gonna be huge that we get that uh that we get that done. And then um the Miami uh I believe it what is it? Um yeah, the Miami Herald put out an article um just after the hire. Um and I wanted to go over that quickly. Um, and here is that article for you guys. So 
Uh, this is what they said. New Dolphins coach Mike McDaniel has hit the ground running and building his initial staff, and he's bringing in a 49ers assistant with them. San Francisco tight ends coach and assistant coach John Embry will join McDaniel in the same role, a league source confirmed Wednesday. Embry 56 just finished his fifth season in San Francisco. Under stewardship, George Kittle has emerged as one of the best tight ends in the league. 2018, Kittle recorded 1,377 receiving yards, then a season single-season record for tight ends. Tell Kansas City's Travis Kelsey broke the mark, 1,416 yards in 2020. Being able to start my NFL career with Embry was the best possible thing for me, Kittle wrote in an Instagram post Wednesday. Embry, who grew up in Colorado like McDaniel, has also coached tight ends with the Chiefs and Tampa Bay Buccaneers and had a two-year stint as a head coach at Colorado as alma mater. Embry has also coached wide receivers and tight ends at Colorado and UCLA, where Daniel Graham and Mercedes Lewis became Mackey Award winners, an honor given to college football's top tight end. The son of former NFL wide receiver John Embry, John Embry, without the H, had a short stint in the NFL as a tight end from 87 to 90 with until an emo, elbow injury ended his career. The Dolphins are potentially facing a bear covered at the tight end position. Mike Gusecki and Derm Smythe, who both set career marks for receptions and yards in 2021, are pending UFAs. Adam Shaheen is under contract through 2020, and Hunter Long, the team's third round pick in 2021, is signed through 2024 but played sparingly as a rookie. San Francisco Chronicle first reported Embry is joining McDaniel's staff in the same role. McDaniel is also retaining special teams coordinator Danny Crossman, according to ESPN. Crossman, 55, joined Brian Flores' as initial staff as special teams coordinator in 2019 and was also given the title of assistant head coach prior to the 2021 season. So I'm just guessing that he no longer holds that title. That he's no longer, he's just a special teams coordinator, right? Um, so under Crossman, um, kicker Jason Sanders was a first team all pro selection in 2020, but he struggled in 2021, missing eight of 31 field goal attempts. Punter Matt Pilardi also struggled at times in his first season with the team, but improved in the second half, being named Week 13 AFC Special Teams Player of the Week. And after trading return specialist Jakeem Grant early in the season, the Dolphins never found a replacement, ranking 30th and 31st in punt return average and kick return average, respectively. The Dolphins Special Team Unit ranked 6th in 2020, according to uh, Football Outsiders' efficiency rankings, but regressed to 29th in 2021. While McDaniel is expected to consider retaining parts of the staff's defensive staff, a key assistant is interviewing for another opportunity. According to NFL Network, defensive backs coach Gerald Alexander is interviewing Wednesday for the Jacksonville Jaguars defensive coordinator vacancy under coach Doug Peterson. Alexander, 37, just completed his second season with the Dolphins. A former NFL safety who had a two-year stint with the Jacksonville Jaguars and also briefly played for the Dolphins, Alexander has played a pivotal role in the development of young players such as Javon Holland and Brandon Jones. Holland and Jones were inserted as starters in the middle of the season and helped lead a defense that finished 10th in Football Outsiders efficiency rankings. Okay, here is the issue right here. Um, all right, so if it was reported earlier today, um, and I think we're going to lose them, it was reported at about t just before 1 o'clock, Ian Rappaport was the first on it, that Gerald Alexander was going to be interviewing with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, and obviously he's a former Jags player himself. And people might be saying to themselves, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a huge jump. You know, this man is going from being the DB coach to now this man is about to be given a defensive coordinator position. Well, everyone knows, absolutely love this guy. This is one of the few guys at the staff I wanted to stick around. And it looks like he's going to be leaving. Um, and I'm really sad. And I'm going to show you why it's even worse than we thought. I'm going to show you why it's even worse than the thought. But, yeah, it does look like Jailed Alexander is going to be going for greener pastures potentially. Now, I don't know what the deal is if this job falls through, but if he's exploring options, you got to be thinking he might not be sticking around, right? And what happened today was very, very interesting. 
And what I'm talking about is this. On Twitter today, Gerald Alexander's wife, it is now deleted, but Twitter always keeps the receipts. Gerald Alexander's wife, said this, when the defense got better this season, did you notice G.A., Gerald Alexander, wasn't on the sideline anymore? His role changed for the better of the defense. But people think it was flow. And this is in response to play calling. She is implying right now that Gerald, G.A. is Gerald Alexander. She, this is, Chris Alexander is Gerald Alexander's wife. This person is Gerald Alexander's wife. She is implying that George Alex Gerald Alexander was moved to the booth and was calling plays. That is what she is telling us right now. That Gerald Alexander was the one calling plays for our defense. That is what she's implying. So, you know how people said it was Boyer or Flores or blah, 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 blah? No, it was Gerald Alexander. That was the change. You remember how I thought even Flores must have taken it over, even though I didn't have confirmation because there was clearly a difference? No, he sent Gerald Alexander up there. So. That is huge, huge, huge news, man. And now we might lose him. We might lose the guy who figured out how to call our defense. At this rate, if you can't get Vic Fangio, is it far-fetched to toy with the idea of Gerald Alexander as our defensive coordinator? I don't think it is. I think this is a realistic option to consider right now. You have to at least interview him. You have to at least give him an interview, man. You have to explore this, Mike. So, I'm fine if we get Vic... But, man, part of me is sad that we can't promote Gerald Alexander under Vic and make Gerald Alexander the the DC in waiting under Fangio. That would be the most ideal outcome. And to be honest with you, if we can't get Fangio, Alexander, I think, should be a top option with this defense and how it's currently constructed. I think this has to be a realistic option with Gerald Alexander as it. So, shout out to Brian Flores for trying to take credit out here and not shining the light on Gerald Alexander because you could have really propped that man up. But, hey, after what you did to Lovey Smith, why am I not surprised? Someone tell me why I'm not surprised. So, hey, Gerald Alexander, his wife, drops the absolute bombshell on Twitter, letting us know who was really up in that booth calling plays, who was really getting it done, who was really putting our defense together. Shout out to Gerald Alexander. Knew this guy was a young star on the rise. From the moment we fired Flo, one of the few guys I didn't want to lose. And now... We may lose them. So, shout out to Chris Alexander. Shout out to her for letting us know what the deal is, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And it's a since-deleted tweet, too. So, um, And then finally, guys, if you haven't seen it yet, Roger Goodell actually did comment on the bribery allegations today 
And what he had to say was this. Um, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell had his Super Bowl press conference on Wednesday, and he was asked about the lack of minority head coaches in the league in recent years. The issue came to the forefront recently after former Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores filed a class action lawsuit against the NFL, Dolphins, Giants, and Broncos last week. Flores also alleged that Dolphins owner Stephen Ross offered him $100,000 for each loss back in 2019 so the team could land the number one overall pick in the 2021 NFL draft. Goodell said during his press conference that it was, quote unquote, very disturbing because it could infect, affect, sorry, the integrity of of the game and the sport. He reiterated that the NFL will look into the allegations and if it finds anything that violates the integrity of the league, it quote unquote won't be tolerated. In addition to the civil lawsuit, Goodell said the NFL will deal with discrimination in a serious way. If he believes that teams are violating that principle. The commissioner said that the league won't tolerate racism. We won't tolerate discrimination. Goodell said that the NFL will see if policies like the Rooney rule need to be modified. Sure. Whoa. This is a lot different than, you know, man, you guys were quick to come out and say all these allegations are without merit. Now I'm sitting here looking at this and this is a totally different thing here. We're, we're seeing here. Goodell added he bears responsibility for the league's struggles in improving diversity in coaching and other high-ranking positions on teams and in the league. He said that as a league, there is no subject that has been discussed more frequently over the past five years other than increasing diversity. Goodell says the league needs to make sure we are doing everything we possibly can to be more successful. I mean... It's going to be interesting to see. There are, you know, I'm sure changes are going to come to some extent, but it's going to it's going to be interesting to see if they're just fluff changes or they're real changes towards, you know, making a real difference in terms of having more diversity in executive management, um, coaching, coordinating, and ownership roles. And speaking of diversity, when it comes to ownership roles, Something that's kind of flown under any, everyone's radar here is, I don't know if everyone saw this, but there was a report out yesterday um, from Bloomberg. And um, it uh, it was in regards to Byron Allen says he's prepare, preparing bid for NFL's Denver Broncos. Media mogul Byron Allen is preparing a bid for, for the Denver Broncos, a move that, if successful, would make him the first black majority owner of an of a National Football League team. He said, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell and New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft came to me in November of 2019 and asked me to take a good look at buying an NFL team. Allen, chairman and chief executive officer at Allen Media Group, said in a statement in response to inquiries about his interest in the Broncos. So... Here we go. Right now, we are in a position where Byron Allen may be the first ever black owner of an NFL team. So the wheels are in motion. They found um, an owner who's willing to take that on. Um, and, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how that sale unfolds. And, you know, I'm hoping... Byron Allen buys the Denver Broncos. Let's get some change and let's start that trickle down effect. You know what I mean? Um, I think uh, that would be, you know, great for the African American community, you know, great for minorities in all of sports because the NFL is the big bad wolf that won't let anyone in. And so if that happens, I mean, I think that's an awesome, awesome change. Um, fake spike 94, 499. Did Flores really lead Miami to two winning seasons? seasons if Flores is ghost coaching. Ooh, man. Did you just did you just come through 
and drop the ghost writing ghost did you just come through with that did you just come through with the ghost writing ghost coaching comparison i appreciate the hell out of that i'm going to tell you that right now fake spike appreciate that man Man, and I gotta say, man, shout out to Rhino Sith in the comments. It's nice to have the God of the Mod Squad back taking care of the comments section. Um, 609 of you in the room. Let's go ahead. Let's smash that like button. I appreciate each and every one of you spending some of your Wednesday night with me. Um, the deal is this, guys. Um, I am going to be getting out of here in the next few minutes because um, I got to go put my kid to bed and then I got to get ready and I got to actually re record a pod um, with Richmond and ball game at about 7:45, eight o'clock. And I'm going to pump that out. Then it's going to be Yellowstone night with the wife. Um, so here's the deal guys. Um, if anything breaks tomorrow again, cause I mean like, you know, if, you know, if we hire Vic Fangio tomorrow, I will be back. All right. Um, so I just wanted to get out here, get my thoughts out on the Jim, John Embry hire. I think it's a big hire. You know what I mean? I think it's it, it is a big hire, for, especially for a guy like Hunter Long. When you look at this guy's track record, you look at what Embry's done with tight ends in the NFL. Hunter Long, you know, his stock can only rise from here up. So one of the few remaining good remnants of the Flores regime is still around could be Hunter Long under John Embry. So and I do think, you know, as long as the price is right, bringing back Smythe should definitely be on the table. Um, I definitely think that should be an option. Now with Gasecki, this is going to be a touchy subject. You know, it's going to be really interesting to see how this gets franchise tagged. Um, shout out. Thank you, Dennis. Love your show. Um, he says, keep up the great work. I appreciate that. Guys, smash that like button, man. Help me out with my friend, Al Go Rhythm. I've dropped the link if any of you guys want to come back here and talk. Um, usually, I like to, to bring everyone. You know, that's how we build the community. People want to come back here, talk. Let's let's, let's shoot the shit a little bit. Um, uh, we're back. We don't talk about Clumpty Dumpty. We don't talk about Bozo the Clown on here, bro. Um, Appreciate the kind words, Omar. Appreciate the kind words, man. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm going to drop that link for you guys. If you guys want to come back, chop it up a little bit back here. Um, you know, well, you know how we always do, man. Um, guys, I appreciate you. Man, the love we've been getting recently on this channel. Um, all of you coming out. You know, we had over 600 people here and that was just like a preemptive show tonight man thank you so much for honestly continues continuing to bless the streams to bless the shows i appreciate each and every one of you with your input whether good or bad in the comments section man i just appreciate all of you for you know supporting the channel hitting the like button um hitting that subscribe button and to all of you that you know take the time to donate or become a patreon or youtube channel member i want each and every one of you know that i truly love you for the way you support me and for allowing me to do this the way i do it and you know it's on like donkey kong we going down to training camp this year we going out to some games this year and we're gonna have boots on the ground and the coverage is only gonna get better and i'm gonna tell y'all by the middle of march beginning of april we are taking it to a next level on this channel, my friends. And I, I hope you stick around for the journey of that because we're going to flip the script on this Dolphins community. All right. Until then, guys. Until next time. If nothing breaks tomorrow, I'll see you guys on Friday. If something does break tomorrow, then I'll be back tomorrow. But until then, until next time, I love each and every one of you, even the haters. Man, you just make me get better each and every time man so fins up all day every day and i will see y'all next time appreciate you guys stay happy healthy safe and blessed